If somebody asks you a question tonight, is, Amer is America's faith for real? What would your answer be? Is America's faith real? What would your answer be? Well, God is often spoken about in public life, is he not? Not always in the best of terms, unfortunately, but uh, it is a fact. Despite attacks from the ACLU and others, other American groups, there's still a, a, a strong consciousness of God in our society. Um, in God we trust, still impressed upon our coinage, our currency. One nation under God is still a part of our Pledge of Allegiance. So to be sure, the vast majority of Americans still believe something about God. But there are signs that there are quite a few that are less certain about this belief than in years past. And a small but growing majority of Americans say that they don't believe in God at all. About 30 years ago, I think it was about 30 years ago, about 71% of Americans claimed an absolutely certain belief in God. Today that percentage has dropped to about 63%. About 20% of Americans claim to lead a very Christian life. And that's a rather ambiguous term. But that's only one side of the story. Although four out of five consider themselves to be religious, only one in five say that religion is the most influential factor in his or her life. Most people claim that they want religion of some sort for their children. But religion ranks far below many other parents say that they want for their children. There's a glaring lack of knowledge about the Ten Commandments and the basic facts of our religious heritage. There's a high level of credulity, a lack of spiritual discipline in the religious life of most Americans, according to a Gallup poll. This matter of religious indifference fills the center portion of the book of Zechariah, chapter 7 and 8, that we'll be looking at tonight. By the time these two chapters were written, about two years had passed since Zechariah had received the vision of chapters 1, and si 1 through 6 that we've been talking about. Now you say, well, you spend a lot of time on chapters 1 through 6 with the various visions and so forth. Uh, how come tonight you're cramming everything into two chapters, 7 and 8? Well, the reason is because they just simply fit together well and... Uh, Someone suggested that maybe I was getting bored with this. Well, I can assure you I'm not. I do want to get to the end of it because we've got further studies to go, but it's certainly not a matter of disinterest. Father, as we begin our study tonight, help us all to have open minds and ready to assimilate information that perhaps we've not known before. Help us to take this knowledge, Father, that we gain and share it with those uh, that we encounter in Bible study uh, situations. Help us also to share it because uh, we'll bring glory to our wonderful Heavenly Father. Thank you, Father, for this opportunity. And now we, I'd ask you to open our eyes that we might behold something wonderful out of your law. In Jesus' name, amen. The temple that we've been talking about in the previous chapters has been about halfway completed. And realizing that to be true, a group of people from the nearby town of Bethel that we mentioned last week had come to Jerusalem to ask the priest and the prophets if it was proper for them to continue a fast, marking the destruction of the temple that they 
uh, and their fathers had been observing uh, since the fall of Jerusalem, since uh, 70 years before. The Mosaic Law had been established. It had only established one fast for the nation of Israel. That fast was on the Day of Atonement, and even then, the fast was only a part of that day's observance. But since the fall of Jerusalem to the Babylonians, the Jews of the exile had been observing a series of fasts designed around significant events in the siege of Jerusalem. We began to uh, look at that a little bit last week. On the 17th day <clears throat> of the fourth month, Thamuz, which corresponds roughly to our July, they mourned the capture of the city. On the ninth day of the fifth month of Ab, that would be sometime around August, they remembered the burning of the city and the destruction of Nebuchadnezzar's temple. On the third day of the seventh month, which would be Tishri, or October, they commemorated the assassination of Gedaliah and the massacre of 80 men from Shechem, Shiloh, and Samaria, as recorded in Jeremiah 4, 1 through 10. The fasts were appropriate during the time of the exile as a device for keeping the memory of those events alive in the minds of the people. But now as we read, the temple is being rebuilt. And so it was a valid question as to whether a fast marking the temple's destruction was still appropriate. Unfortunately, the people of Bethel had failed to see that in God's sight, the matter was far more important than simply whether or not a traditional fast should be celebrated. This fast on the Day of Atonement and others like it had been perverted into what was by this time merely an empty uh, and superstitious uh, formalism just as it happened earlier in Israel's history. It has happened many times since in various religious denominations. Now, the reply of God to all of these inquiries was to move the people away from mere formalism toward seeking God. God's reply has several parts, each of which we're going to look at tonight because they do deserve some study. And they are as follows, if you have a pen and pencil, you might want to write these down. One, a reproof of mere ceremonial religion. Chapter 7, verses 4 through 10. Number two, an encouragement for the pursuit of true religion based on the fate of the people's predecessors and the future blessing of Jerusalem. I know I'm going rapidly, but I can give these to you later if you miss them all, or if you miss some of them. An encouragement for the pursuit of true religion, based on the fate of the people's predecessors and the future blessing of Jerusalem. Chapter 7, verses uh, 11 to 18. Number three, a reminder of the people's present duty. A reminder of the people's present duty. Chapter 8, verse, uh, verses 9 through 13. Number 4, a prediction of the transformation of all feasts, or fasts rather. A prediction of the transformation of all fasts into a joyful occasion, or joyful occasions, plural. Chapter 8, verses 14 through 19. And lastly, a forecast of the calling of the Gentiles to salvation. A calling of the Gentiles to salvation. Chapter 8, verses 20 to 23. So let's first look at this, number one, a reproof of mere ceremonial religion. Take your Bibles and turn to chapter 7 of, of Zechariah if you've not already done so. And follow after me. Chapter 7, verse 4. Then came the word of the Lord of hosts unto me, saying, Speak 
unto all the people of the land and to the priests, saying, When ye fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh month, even those seventy years, did ye at all fast unto me, even to me? And when ye did eat, and when ye did drink, did not ye eat for yourselves and drink for yourselves? Should ye not hear the words which the Lord hath cried by, by the former prophets when Jerusalem was inhabited and in prosperity, and the cities thereof round about her, when men inhabited the south and the plain? When the delegation from Bethel came to Jerusalem to seek the mind of, of God about their fast, they must have ex expected a simple answer. Yes, continue it, or no, don't continue it. Instead, God gave Zechariah the answers that we saw here, starting at verse 5. Speak unto all the people of the land and to the priests, saying, When ye fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh month, even though seventy years did ye at all fast unto me, even for me. And then verse 7, Should ye not hear the words which the Lord hath cried by the former prophets when Jerusalem was inhabited and in prosperity, and the cities thereof round about her, when men inhabited the south and the plain. And verse 9 and 10, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Ex Execute true judgment, and show mercy and compassion every man to his brother, and oppress not the widow, nor the fatherless, the stranger, nor the poor, and let none of you imagine evil against his brother in your heart. The point is really quite clear. I think God isn't content with mere ceremonial acts. He actually hates such acts if they're not uh, <clears throat> preceded and accompanied by a genuine love for God and other people. When Zechariah quotes God as saying, Should ye not see, hear the words which the Lord hath cried by the former prophets? He doesn't say what particular prophets the Lord has in mind, but it's not hard to bring some of them forward with just a little thought. In all of the Old Testament, the chief passages on fa fasting is probably in Isaiah chapter 58. If you want to turn there quickly, Isaiah 58. And uh, verse 3. They had fasted, these people in Zechariah that we read about. But God hadn't responded by giving them what they asked for. So they asked, Why have we fasted? And you have not seen it. Why have we humbled ourselves and you haven't noticed? Isaiah 58, 3. Wherefore have we fasted? Say they, and thou seest not. Wherefore have we afflicted our soul, and thou takest no knowledge? Behold, in the day of your fast ye find pleasure, and exact all your labors. What they meant was, why are we fasting? Why are we going through all this trouble if what we're doing doesn't work? And Isaiah goes on in verse 4 and through 9. Behold, ye fast for strife and debate, and to smite with the fist of wickedness. Ye shall not fast as ye do this day, to make your voice to be heard on high. Is it such a fast that I have chosen, a day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head as a bulrush, and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Wilt thou call this a fast, and an acceptable day to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I have chosen? to loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the impressed, oppressed go free, and that ye break every yoke? Is it not to deal, thy, to deal thy bread to the hungry, and that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house, when thou seest the naked, that thou cover him, and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh? Then shall the light 
break forth at the morning, and thine health shall spring forth speedily, and thy righteousness shall go before thee. The glory of the Lord shall be thy re-reward. Re then shalt thou call, and the Lord shall answer. Thou, thou shalt cry, and he shall say, Here I am. If thou take away from the midst of thee the yoke, the putting forth of the finger, and speaking vanity. Probably the greatest passage in the Bible on religious celebrations in the Old Testament. But it's not the only one. Shortly before this, Amos had written in uh, Amos 5, uh, 21, if you want to turn there quickly, book of Amos, chapter 5, verse 21 through 24. I hate, I despise your feast days, and I will not smell in your solemn assemblies. Though ye offer the burnt offerings and your meat offerings, I will not accept them. Neither will I regard the peace offerings of your fat beasts. Take thou away from me the noise of thy songs, for I will not hear the melody of thy vials. But let judgment run down as waters and righteousness as a mighty stream. The same principle that we just read about is found in 1 Samuel 5.22. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. In Zechariah's statement, there are two things for which the people are faulted. First, the worshipers weren't seeking or serving God in their fasting. This is the importance of the words, unto me, even unto me, in verse 5 of chapter 7, and for yourselves in verse 6. The point is that the people simply weren't doing their fasting for God. In the second case, the reference is to eating and drinking. And again, the point is that they were doing it for themselves. In other words, it doesn't matter whether they were fasting or feasting. In each case, they were pleasing themselves. The second thing for which the people were faulted is that their worship, whether fasting or by anything else, didn't lead to acts of mercy <clears throat> to the abandoned and the oppressed. Yet this is what Isaiah, Amos, Samuel, Moses and in fact, all of the prophets and writers of Scripture called for. So number one, we have God's reproof of mere ceremonial religion. And it follows naturally then that the next thing that God would say would be encourage the pursuit of true religion based on the fate of the people's predecessors and the future blessing of Jerusalem. Chapter 7, 11 through 8, 18. The second part of God's answer to the delegation from Bethel was an encouragement for them to abandon their empty and superstitious formalism and pursue instead the kind of true and pleasing religion that he had just mentioned. That is, they were to seek God and act with mercy toward the oppressed and abandoned God. God uses two lines of argument. First of all, he reminds them of the fate of their predecessors. They had been informed about the kind of worship that God desired, but they had hardened their hearts and so brought judgment upon themselves. Zechariah writes in chapter 7, 11 through 14, But they refused to hearken and pulled away the shoulder and stopped their ears that they should not hear. Yea, they made their hearts as an ed edament stone, lest they should hear the law and the words which the Lord of hosts has sent in his spirit by the former prophets. Therefore came a great wrath from the Lord of hosts. Therefore it has come to pass that as he cried and they would not hear, so they cried and I would not hear, saith the Lord of hosts. But I scattered them with a whirlwind among the nations whom they knew not. 
Thus the land was desolate after them, that no man passed through the through through not returned, for they laid the pleasant land desolate. The second line of argument is the promised future blessing of Jerusalem, which has been a theme throughout the book. And now we move into chapter eight, where Zechariah writes in the first eight verses. Again the word of the Lord of hosts came to me, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I was jealous for Zion with great jealousy, and I was jealous for her with great fury. Thus saith the Lord, I am returned unto Zion, and, I, and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and Jerusalem shall be called a city of truth, and the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, there shall yet old men and old women dwell in the streets of Jerusalem and every man with his staff in his hand for every age. And the streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in the streets thereof. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, if it be marvelous in the eyes of the remnant of this people in these days, should it also be marvelous in mine eyes, saith the Lord of hosts. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, behold, I will save my people from the east country and from the west country, and I will bring them, and they shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. And they shall be my people, and I will be their God in truth and in righteousness. <clears throat> the remarkable thing about these incentives for true and pure religion is that there really is nothing remarkable about them. It's simply the old theme of Deuteronomy where there is obedience, the promise that obedience will bring a blessing. Where there is disobedience, there will be judgment. The history of Israel shows that to be true. Now we come to the reminder of the people's duty. At first glance, the third item in God's reply to the delegation from Bethel appears kind of out of place because it has to do with the rebuilding of the temple. And as a reminder to get on with that work, we see that in 8, verse 9. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, let your hands be strong, ye that hear in these days these words by the mouth of the prophets, which were in the day that the foundation of the house of the Lord of hosts was laid, that the temple might be built. What does that have to do with fasting? The reminder would be appropriate in the book of Haggai, for example, which dealt entirely with the rebuilding of the temple. It might even seem placed in another chapter of Zechariah, which speaks of Zerubbabel's role in completing the temple's reconstruction. But why here, in a chapter that talks about the nature of true religion? The reason is simply that uh, obedience concerns specifics, not just any specifics. It concerns a particular task or command that God has laid upon us. In this case, it concerned the command of God through his prophets to rebuild the temple, the center of their religious life. We like to talk about obedience in general terms without coming to grips with what God is requiring or we talk about specifics if there is not any real great probability that we'll have to deal with it in our own lives. Several years ago, I talked with a young man. If you, some of you folks think back, you might realize who it is. I talked with a young man who was making a shambles of his life. He had come to see me because things had gotten so far out of hand and so bad for him that he had no place else to turn, and he knew that his sin was hurting him. He was aware that he was wasting good years in blatant disobedience, and he needed fellowship. He needed Bible study. He needed a regular job. He needed all of those things that make for um, sound and uh, a growing Christian experience. 
But the point of my story is that when he came to me, he already knew those things. He had already known them because we had spoken of them several months before and several months before that. The process of correspondent communication had gone on for a long time. This young man knew exactly what he should do, but he wasn't doing it. You say, but the things that we're dealing with here were so, are so basic. Everybody knows that they should read their Bible. Everybody knows that they should spend time with other Christians. Work at a job. <clears throat> kind of mundane things sometimes, but who said that obedience always is exciting? Who said that the necessary elements of a sound and growing Christian experience are always thrilling? Now, recently we've had a lot of testimonies about some things that have been happening here and happening in the lives of individual people. And it is thrilling when we bring someone to the Lord or when we see a Christian mature or when we see some things happening uh, that are wonderful in the life of another Christian. There are often exciting moments in following God. Some things are indeed thrilling. But the more necessary things are more than not, often than not, simply hard, hard work. So having said that, we come to the fourth item in God's reply to the group from Bethel. A transformation of all of the fasts into joyful occasions. Look with me at chapter 8, verses 14 through 19. For, this, for thus saith the Lord of hosts, as I thought to punish you when your fathers provoked me to wrath, saith the Lord of hosts, and I repented not. So again have I brought in the, these days to do well unto Jerusalem and to the house of Judah, fear ye not. These are the things that ye shall do. Speak ye every man the truth to his neighbor. Execute the judgment of truth and peace in your gates. And let none of you imagine evil in your hearts against his neighbor. And love no false oath. For all these things that I hate, saith the Lord. And the word of the Lord of hosts came unto me, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the fast of the fourth month and the fast of the fifth and the fast of the seventh, and the fast of the tenth, shall be to the house of Judah joy and gladness and cheerful feast. Therefore, love the truth and peace. After the specific command to his people to be faithful to the task of rebuilding the temple, the Lord briefly reviews the ground already covered and gives his specific answer to the question posed by the delegation from Bethel. First, he reminds them of what he had said concerning judgment on their predecessors for their empty and offensive religious practices. That was in verse 14. As I thought to punish you when your fathers provoked me to wrath, saith the Lord of hosts, and I repented not. Next, he reminds them of his, the promise of future blessings in verse 15. So again have I thought in these days to do well unto Jerusalem and to the house of Judah, fear ye not. Third, he restates the definition of true religion that appeared in the previous chapter, verses 16 and 17. Then having reviewed this ground, he gives his final answer to the question about fasts. The fasts of Israel will be transformed into joyous occasions. Now the question comes, when would all of this happen? It's tempting to say, well, right away, or at least as soon as the rebuilding of the temple is completed. But the feasts of Israel were not turned in, the fasts of Israel were not turned into happy occasions, not turned into happy festivals at that time. Indeed, it hasn't happened yet. The feasts of the 4th, the 5th, the 7th, and the 10th months are still observed in Judaism. So then we have to ask the question, when will it be? Well, I think this is another passage pointing to a restored Israel 
in the last days. I believe that the ultimate fulfillment of this prophecy will be in the days of a regathered Israel during the millennium when the Jews will be witnesses to the reality of God's salvation. Now the last part of God's answer to the Bethel delegation. The forecast of the calling of the Gentiles to salvation in uh, verse, chapter 8, verses 20 to 23. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, it shall yet come to pass that there shall come people and the inhabitants of many cities, and the inhabitants of one city shall go to another, saying, Let us go speedily to pray before the Lord, and to seek the Lord of hosts, I will go also. Yea, many people and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to pray before the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, In those days it shall come to pass that ten men shall, shall take hold out of all languages of the nations, even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, We will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. <coughs> This is a picture telling how in the last future day the people and nations of the world will go up to Jerusalem to entreat the Lord and how many will take hold of the edge of the robe of one Jew to go up with him. And what we just read is what the Lord Almighty says. That will be the day in which it will be known to all of the Jews have again, that they have again found favor with God and that God will be found through those he has reclaimed to be his chosen people. We Gentiles are not seizing hold of the edge of the Jews' robe to go up with him to Jerusalem today. But we are praying and witnessing to the Jews that they might come to salvation. Nevertheless, we are clinging to that seamless robe of the one Jew, Jesus of Nazareth, who because of his work on the cross is the only basis anyone may approach God and plead with him for spiritual blessings. On that particular point, Thomas Moore, perhaps one of the greatest commentators on the book of Zechariah, has written this. And bear with me while I read it to you. When this prediction was uttered, nothing seemed more hopelessly improbable than its fulfillment. The Jews were a poor, despised, obscure tribe in the heart of Syria, whose existence was only known to the mighty world by the furnishing a, them, them, their furnishing a trophy to the victorious areas of Babylon. Greece was just writing in the firmament of human history. And as she ascended to her brilliant zenith, her track was marked by the sweeping of the phalanxes of Alexander and the legions of Antiochus over the hills and valleys of Judea. And yet this prophecy remained unfulfilled. Rome was then in the rugged feebleness of her world-nursed infancy and slowly continued to grow until she reached that gigantic stature in which she ruled the earth and her conquering legions under Pompeii again swept over the faded land and even desecrated the places of her holy solemnities. Five hundred years rolled away, and yet this prophecy remained unfulfilled, indeed seemed farther from fulfillment than when it was uttered. But at length time arrived, and there came to Jerusalem men out of every nation under heaven, Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, and the dwellers of Mesopotamia, and in Judea, and Cappadocia, and Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, and Egypt, and in the parts of Libya, and Cyrene, and strangers of Rome, Jews, and proselytes, Cretes, and Arabians, all came up to Jerusalem to seek the face of Jehovah. And from the lips of a Jew they heard the words that caused them to cry out, Men and brethren, what shall I do? They scattered to their own homes again and carried with them the strange words that had so deeply moved their souls. And being followed by these wonder-working men, they soon be, there soon began to, 
to work a new life among the nations of the earth. And this life took hold in its origin and efficacy upon a Jew. Greece with her polished, polished dialectics, Rome with her mailed mightiness, Asia with her soft voluptuousness, all submitted to the authority of a savior who was a Jew. All rested their hopes for eternity upon a Jew and soon received as divinely inspired the words and writings of men who were Jews. And for nearly 2,000 years, the mightiest intellects and largest hearts of the race have breathed the spirit and studied the words of men who were Jews and have sought as the most precious boon of existence the privilege of being covered with a robe of righteousness that was wrought by the divinely incarnated hands of one who is the seed of Abraham after the flesh, though as to his higher nature, God over all blessed forever. And at this day, there are literally men of all nations and kindreds and tribes and people who are laying hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew and casting in their lot with those whom God chose to be a people for himself and resting their hopes on that crucified Jew who is the Savior of the world. Those words <clears throat> are a response to the invitation given in chapter 2 of Zechariah at verses 6 and 7. I found it kind of hard to read that without getting choked up a little bit. Jesus Christ indeed has done so much for us. In that earlier chapter of Zechariah, chapter 2, God invited the people to come to him. He said, Ho, ho, come forth and, free, and flee from the land of the north. Deliver thyself, O Zion, and dwellest with the daughter of Babylon. In chapter 8, the people reply to this call and reply, We will go with you, for we have heard that God is with us. God is with us tonight, folks. Have you heard the cry? Come follow me. Happy is the one that is among them who hear the call today and go with Jesus. Heavenly Father, I thank you tonight for this opportunity to share some thoughts about Zechariah, a wonderful book, calling us once more to obedience and giving us that promise that Jesus is the answer to all of life's problems. Help us not only to see this situation, this truth for ourselves, Father, but to share it with those that we encounter, that they might know the joy of living for Jesus and the promise of sharing that life for all of eternity with him. Now, Father, as we go to our prayer time, help us to remember the needs of others and raise up the pleas of those that are not able to be here and raise them themselves, or perhaps not even from their own beds of pain can they raise their own pleas. So open our hearts, Father, in a merciful manner and help us to remember those who are oppressed, hurting, downtrodden and those that need encouragement. In Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen.